G'day Internet, welcome back to another video. This computer sitting right here is a Laser 310. Now, if you've never heard of that computer before uh, and live outside of Australia, uh, I don't really blame you, but here within Australia, it is better known as the Dick Smith VZ300, uh, which had a model before that, which was the VZ200, both of which will make an appearance uh, in this video. The VZ range of computers was a low cost entry computer uh, sold here within Australia. So for those uh, outside here, uh, think kind of more ZX81 with color versus something like a Spectrum, if that kind of puts it into perspective. All these computers were made by VTech. Yes, the same company that makes all the kids learning computers and also produced the Laser XT and Laser 128 computers, which have been shown off by Adrian and uh, the 8-bit guy over the last few years. But to give a quick rundown of the history of this computer, and I have notes, the VZ200 uh, originally hit shores uh, of Australia around 1983. It was first advertised in Electronics Australia in June of that year, uh, with the VZ300 coming later in 1985. The main difference between the two, uh, the uh, VZ200 only had 8K of RAM, uh, while the VZ300 had a whopping 16, uh, both of which were expandable later on with memory upgrade cartridges. The only real difference between the Laser 210 and the VZ200 uh, was that the Laser variant uh, only came with four kilobytes of RAM, but the VZ300 and the Laser 310 were identical apart from the sticker. So in the process of my research of this little computer, it turns out it was sold under various different brands around the world, such as uh, Texet, uh, the Smart Alec Jr., uh, and the Celtron. So it's entirely possible that viewers out there may know this computer under one of those brands. Now, like many computers of its day, there was a plethora of uh, accessories available, uh, both off the shelf and as DIY kits. You've got to realize, and we'll get to this in a minute, the early computing and electronics hobby within Australia was very DIY based. Uh, Electronics Australia uh, was a magazine that published lots of how-tos uh, and schematics on how you could build your own accessories uh, and modifications for your home computer. Uh, and we'll see a good example of that in a minute. But uh, off the shelf, there were things like a light pen, there was the aforementioned uh, memory upgrades of 32K for either the VZ200 or the 300. There was also a disk drive and disk drive interface cartridge available. Uh, and you may recognize this kind of setup uh, on the Tandy Coco, which used a similar kind of idea structure, whatever you want to call it, to hook up a disk drive to it. Uh, a few notable DIY uh, accessories that you could build back in the day, uh, published in Electronics Australia, and I've got it uh, down here. One was nicknamed the VZ Adlib, which was a uh, sound card that you could add to the expansion slot, uh, which used the TI-76489 chip, which I think that's the same one as the Adlib. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, there was also schematics published for a voice synthesizer. And just to add on to that list, uh, a few adventurous VZ owners also came up with a mouse that you could run out of the RS-232 port, uh, and also uh, be able to hook up a 720 kilobyte IBM three and a half inch disk drive. But like a lot of uh, microcomputers of the 80s, by 1991, uh, the VZ range had pretty much disappeared from Australian shelves. Uh, and 1993 saw the close of the last user group within Australia. Now, speaking of user groups, they were in very, very important part of computing uh, for the hobbyist, the enthusiast, uh, the home computer user here in Australia. And I quote uh, Bob Kitch here, who wrote specifically about the VZ. 
The VZ computer quickly gained a large following and was clearly a marketing success for Dick Smith Electronics. They claim to have sold in excess of 30,000 of the VZ200. However, Dick Smith's support for the VZ was often found wanting, a very common moan amongst users. The various user groups that sprang into existence provided essential support for the VZ. Without them, the VZ and its users would have probably withered away and gone the way a number of other small computers did. Now, user groups did pop up uh, within Australia in pretty much all the uh, major cities across the country, including a few across the pond in New Zealand, where Dick Smith actually had a presence as well. Uh, I like noted though, the last one pretty much closed in 1993. However, uh, the idea behind that still carries on within the quite active uh, VZ Owners Group on Facebook, where I will put a link in the description. Now, this is obviously the Laser 310 variant, but I do have uh, both a VZ300 uh, and a VZ200 to show you, uh, and then we will dig inside. And the VZ200 has obviously had quite the life. So here is my Laser 310. Uh, it is a fairly simple computer. Uh, you will take note of the keyboard where it has very much a uh, Clive Sinclair-ish extra functions added to almost every key. Uh, one of the main differences though is all these extra functions are optional where on the Sinclair machine you are basically made to use them by default. So as an example, two is just two, but control two is C load. So personally, I actually think that's a better way of doing it. Across the back, we have a few different things. We've got obviously our nine volt power in, uh, we've got a four pin TRRS jack uh, for the cassette. We have composite color out. We've got our expansion slot. We've got a slot here, which takes things like the light pen uh, and the joysticks. Uh, and an RF modulator. And that's pretty much it, other than the power switch on the side. And here is the Laser's cousin, the Dick Smith 300. Other than colors of the keyboard and the case and the badge, it is actually identical, including the ports at the back. This one, however, is dead, and we'll get to why it's dead in a minute. And unfortunately, there's no real saving it, but it's already pulled to pieces, so I'll be able to easily show you the insides. And here is an example of a well-loved VZ200. And to find computers in this state, uh, at least here in Australia, is not actually that uncommon. Uh, you might have seen my well-loved TRS-80 Model 3, and that's a classic example, same as this, of the way computers were actually used here in Australia with DIY mods and little notes scribbled all across it, Obviously, it doesn't make for much of a museum piece these days, but I think it's a good example of how these machines were used. So as an example, this has had switches added to it for wait state, reset and break. Digging inside that broken VZ300, we have its board. Uh, we have its 16K of RAM just here. We have our Zilog Z80 running at 3.5 something megahertz. We've got our ROM. We've got our Motorola 6847 uh, video chip, which yes, is the same one out of the Coco. And yes, this does present itself very green when plugged into the monitor. And these three chips here are the custom chips made by VTEC, which is the Achilles heel of this machine. This particular one has at least one of these dead uh, and only boots to a garbled mess. There is no modern replacement for these. No one has done an FPGA replacement. So basically, if one of these chips dies in the VZ, it's as dead as a doornail. And that's what has killed this particular board. The 6847 can produce eight colors at 32 by 16, uh, or use three colors with two different background colors at 128 by 64. Although the main limitation there is the video RAM, which I believe is this chip here. Uh, and there is actually a mod to upgrade this to give you a higher resolution, which I haven't done, but it sounds like kind of cool. Uh, and I believe a whole bunch of demos are able to uh, utilize that. 
Very simple one bit sound uh, is generated on the computer uh, and actually outputs via a piezo speaker internally mounted in the case. Now, before we actually dig into the computer, I'm actually not going to be uh, using either a disk drive or a cassette deck uh, to load software on the laser. I'm actually going to use this. This is an SD card uh, designed and built by uh, Ben from Benven Electronics, uh, which simply takes a micro SD card uh, and you can, from the ready prompt, uh, load uh, VZ images. So VZ files is basically the standard for disk images uh, and this will load them directly. So that's kind of cool. It also provides a 128 kilobyte memory upgrade, uh, which I guess is always a bonus. So here is our wee little laser 310 all plugged in. We have our ready prompt uh, and all the stuff for uh, Ben's SD card has loaded. Uh, now, to get an idea of what's on this, it is literally duh, uh, and you get a list of all the VZ files. Now, these computers don't have the world's uh, largest software library, and that kind of does go back to um, what Bob Kitch said about Dick Smith's uh, support of the computer. So there's a lot of homebrew from even back in the day. Uh, and so a lot of these are either home ports, there were some, obviously there was some commercial stuff as well. So a reasonable example of what you may have found on this computer back in the day would be, for instance, Galax On, which is obviously a clone of Galaxian, but uh, J for joystick. This is, I reckon, quite a neat little game. It can be quite challenging, but it is reasonably responsive. It's not too slow. Uh, and, well, let's just say the graphics get the job done. We also have our obvious uh, Frogger clone. Uh, blah, 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 one player. Other joystick, other joystick. Uh, which is quite brutal. Come on, I barely touched it. Now, one thing you will notice uh, while I play this game is all the artifacts, what's commonly known as snow, on the screen. This is pretty common across all games uh, on the VZ uh, and it's basically, what's a good example? A good example is like on the early Sinclair machines like the ZX80 where you hit a key and the whole thing, the whole screen would need to refresh. It's very similar to that in the sense that there is constantly uh, refreshing going on with the graphics which is because it's pretty much all provided by the CPU and you end up with artifacts on the screen. I seriously haven't got past the first screen. The VZ also supports a reasonable uh, 3D maze program. Uh, unfortunately, there is no monsters that jump out at you, but it is reasonably capable given the limited hardware. Oh, I think that's where I came in. This isn't a big maze. Did I just go around in circles? So that's not to say that VZ owners over the last 35, 40 years haven't been just sitting idly by. Uh, and I've actually got a couple of modern games to show you written by Jason Oakley. And the first one is a actually pretty reasonable considering the hardware clone of Ghosts and Goblins. Did 
Whoa. And of course, it's as uh, brutally hard as the original. Come on, got it. But I don't know. I think for given the hardware that this is trying to run on, uh, I think that's a ghost. Go away. Nope. Can I go up? Yes, I can. Ah! Yeah, but <laughs> this game seriously impressed me. Another game by Jason just recently was a port of Millipede. Come on, no! Ah, I got kind of close. Millipede, admittedly, is not my usual kind of game, but I do get it. Come on. No, you're too low. Come on, come across. Ah, got me. And just to round things off, here is a game called Pipes. And this game actually plays really well. I don't know, there's something about it that's, you kind of expect, especially a computer as old and as simple as this to be, well, there we go, kind of lack a certain responsiveness. But this game plays really well, especially with the joystick. Wow, I'm doing okay. Maybe I've found my game after all these years. At least I think I'm getting the hang of it. I think you collect the coins and dodge the bad guys. Oh, wait a minute. I think you can kill them by... No, that was another game. Thought you could jump on them. So there we go. A fairly high level overview of the Laser 310 and its brethren. And it is a computer that honestly, I've really come to like. I think I like it primarily for its simplicity. It is not a computer that pretends to be anything other than what it is. And what is it? It is, like I said, an entry level computer from the early to mid 80s. You don't expect much for the money that this uh, retailed for. And I highly suspect that this little computer uh, owes many a programmer and computer enthusiast their livelihood since they first got a taste of it 35, 40 years ago. And for that alone, I honestly think that the Australian computer IT industry owes a lot to this very little, simple computer. The other thing that I am honestly uh, impressed with is uh, the users that still support and maintain uh, and enjoy this computer on the Facebook group. Uh, I've got to give a massive shout out to those guys, uh, allowing idiot me to come in and ask a bunch of stupid questions, but also to keep producing software and games and demos for a machine that for most people time has long forgotten. And while I'm in the mood for shout outs, uh, a couple more. First is to Jason Oakley, uh, who not only wrote some of those games that I showed you before, uh, but was also quite willing to take some time to have a chat with me over Facebook and point me in the uh, right direction for some reference material. Another one is to Ben, who not only created this awesome SD card, uh, but also loaned me uh, a lot of the accessories such as the light pen and the disk drive that you saw in this video. But for now, that will pretty much do it. If you like the video, click like, subscribe, all the usual YouTube-y stuff. Uh, if you'd like to help support the channel, I am on Patreon, just like these wonderful people just here. But until then, I will see you in the next one.